cluster variety. Following way, so u is x minus d, and there's a map. The toric variety x bar d bar, and this is a um, sequence of blow ups. And each blow up um, has the following form. So there's a center of the blow up Z, which is the intersection of a component of the boundary um, with a hypertorus defined by a character. Um, and this um, character is determined in the following way. So we have a, a form, holomorphic symplectic form sigma on x and a corresponding form sigma bar on x bar. And what has to be true is that the residue along C of, of sigma bar <coughs> is equal to d chi over chi up to some constant. <coughs> So it's a very constrained um, situation where the blow-ups um, have to satisfy this, this property. So for instance, maybe I just make the remark straight away. If we only want, <coughs> just recall, so if we only want log club yow, uh, any co-dimension two center will do. Um, contained, of course, the same thing contained in in a unique component of the boundary. So you sort of see the divergence um, in dimension bigger than two between the sort of cluster case, which is roughly holomorphic symplectic case, and the Calabi-Yau case in this um, strong restriction on the sort of centers you're allowed to blow up. <coughs> okay. So uh, what I want to do next is connect this with the usual definition of a cluster variety. So these were, so cluster algebras were introduced by Fermin and Zelovinsky. And then they were given a more geometric interpretation shortly afterwards by Fock and Goncharov. I think this was in 02, so geometric description. Um, so what I'm paraphrasing here is roughly what Fock and Goncharov said, so that there's a, a variety U, which is a union of tori, union of algebraic tori. So this is, this is a union of open sets. <clears throat> um, and these are related um, by um, transition functions of a, of a very special kind. So these are composites. of what's called a mutation. So that's a map mu from the torus, a birational map from the torus to another copy of the same torus. <coughs> and given in coordinates by the following formula. So Z1 Zn maps to Z1 
uh, z2 times 1 plus z1. You have a coordinates staying fixed. <coughs> so this is in some coordinates. So the picture is you start with, um, oh, thank you, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's supposed to have the same dimension. <laughs> right. Um. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so the picture is that you have a bunch of tori. These are labeled by the vertices of some graph, and if two, um, tori correspond to adjacent vertices, then the transition map between the two charts is given in some coordinates by a map of this form, and then the variety u is obtained by taking the union of all these tori. <coughs> okay, and so how does this relate to our picture? So let's relate to our picture. So incidentally, these, um, uh, the set um, alpha, so the, 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 the set of um, labels are called the seeds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so of course, you know, depending on exactly what sort of generality you want. So obviously it's very natural to put a constant in here um, and, you know, I think the original definition, it was exactly what I just wrote, but then people generalized. Um, well, let me, let me try to explain uh, how this relates to our picture, and then maybe you'll see sort of the level of generality that's... Um, that's correct. So uh, I should say, uh, so let's uh, remind ourselves. So there's a parallel series of lectures by Kwarty and Kasprick. And they've been talking about mutations. And yes, indeed, the two mutations are related. But I want to emphasize, I'm talking about the cluster varieties, which are roughly the holomorphic symplectic case. And they're talking about, well, they're talking about Fano varieties. But they're really talking about log Calabi varieties in some sense. Because you know, if I take a Fano variety, I can just take a section of minus k to make it a log Calabi Yau. And so they're really in this slightly more general context where they can blow up any codimension to center, meaning, you know, instead of writing a character here, or which, you know, essentially a monomial, I can write an, a pretty general function. So that explains why my mutation is rather more restrained than theirs. <coughs> okay, so let me just say, so what's, what's the picture here? So this corresponds to uh, the center Z being z1 equals zero, uh, I'm sorry, z2 is equal to zero. So that's my boundary divisor, so this is c, intersected with, um, you know, my character is z1, and my lambda is minus one. Um, so let me sort of draw the picture. So after, so for suitable choice of of the compactification. So again, remember what, what I mean by this is that you know I have this guy x bar, but I don't I really don't care which toric variety it is. I'm allowed to sort of blow up arbitrarily. Um, I'm not changing the interior, just these these toric blow ups. <clears throat> so what's the picture? So then I have. So this boundary divisor is, is a component of my boundary. Here's z. And there's also a sort of opposite boundary divisor. So in terms of the fan picture for the toic varieties, this divisor corresponds to a ray, and I've just inserted the opposite ray. <coughs> so in terms of the fan picture, so there's an opposite divisor. And I can also suitably refine the fan, again corresponding to a toric blow-up, so there's a P1 bundle structure on my toric variety. So this is a picture of x bar. 
Then what do I do? I blow up z. So this is the familiar picture to most algebraic geometry, geometers of a, what's called an elementary transformation. And then uh, let me sort of uh, use the notation from the surface case. So if we're in a surface case, this is really just a P1 bundle over P1, uh, possibly with some degenerate fibers at zero and infinity. This is a, um, a, a fiber, a copy of P1 with self-intersection zero. This becomes a union of two minus one curves, the exceptional curve, let me call it E, and the strict transform of this fiber. And then I can say, well, this is a symmetric picture. Let's blow down the other divisor. So here's my new toric model, the prime, isomorphic to z, of course. And this is x, x bar prime. And so what I'm claiming is that this map on the tori, this is just exactly this mutation. <coughs> So it's an elementary transformation of P1 bundles. And so, again, to say the same thing in different language, um, if I take the union, let's call this T prime maybe. So the union of T and T prime is this intermediate variety, what should we call it, maybe, I don't know, uh, x1 or something. Uh, 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 let's call this, yeah, so, um, <laughs> uh, x hat maybe. Okay, um, so this guy in the middle, um, you know, again, so he's a log Calabi Yao, let's write u hat again for his interior. So this is u hat, the interior of this middle guy, with a co-dimension two subset removed, namely this subset here, let's call it w. And you know, here, so maybe just to emphasize z, w and z prime are all identified. <laughs> so this union of two tori, um, um, in the atlas description of Fock and Goncharov, just corresponds to two toric models, the tori for those two toric models, um, which are related by an uh, elementary transformation of P1 bundles. So I didn't hear the last part. Literally equal, yeah. So, so this map is an isomorph. This map is an isomorphism. Um, okay. So the dictionary uh, what this gives is that so you know in the cluster story they have seeds, they correspond to toric models, and we have. Um, Mutations, they correspond to elementary transformations between these. <coughs> okay, and so now um, we can start drawing some combinatorial pictures to sort of show the effect of these mutations. So we can view mutations using um, the fan of the toric, the toric models x and x prime. So let me just show by one example, I think you'll get the, get the picture. Um, So what do we have here? So let's do an example. So as everybody knows, if I do an elementary transformation 
on P1 cross P1, I get the, the surface F1. Um, so let's draw the picture. Here's my copy of P1 cross P1. Here's my Z, just a point, and dimension two. So again, let me label boundary divisors by self-intersections. <coughs> Do one blow up. And then we blow down the strict transform. So that's just the same picture I drew over there in this particular case. But now if I try to draw the toric fans, so what's the toric fan of P1 cross P1? It's just the, the fan given by the positive, uh, the quadrants in, in R2. And the fan for um, F1, well, we have to make a choice of coordinates, but one choice is like this. That's the fan for F1. And so this mutation, mu, has an analog at the level of fans. It's called the tropicalization of mu. I'll write mu with a subscript T. This is so-called tropicalization. Um, and how is it defined? Well, um, you can say in terms of these two half planes, the left and right half plane, on this half plane it's the identity. Um, and, oops, I'm sorry, I've got the fan wrong. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I should um, you know, draw these rays so they correspond to the boundary devices as, as in this orientation. So this fan should be like this. This is the contractible curve of, of self-intersection minus one. Sorry about that. So here it's a shear by um, the vector V. This is the vector V, which corresponds to the component of the boundary containing Z. The boundary component containing Z. Oops, that's probably not big enough. So, I know that there's been a some discussion of toric varieties, but let me say again, if you've got a toric fan, a fan corresponding to a toric variety, the rays of the fan correspond to the boundary divisors. This ray here corresponds to this boundary divisor along which I'm blowing up. I'm going to shear in that direction uh, on this half plane to produce this, this fan here. And the, um, in the general statement will be there'll be a similar picture. We have a um, transformation defined by a shear which gives the action of this uh, birational transformation on the boundary divisors of your compactification. <clears throat> okay, and I want to say again, so um, this is an instance of the mutations that have been discussed in the parallel course by um, Alan Alessio, and this is the picture that was discussed today where there was a shear transformation corresponding to a mutation. So this um, was the... the Unfortunately, there's a clash of notation. Al was talking about mutations in M, and M was monomials. But here, um, this is um, the mutation in N, the lattice of one parameter subgroups, uh, which corresponds to that under mirror symmetry. <clears throat> but it's the same picture that was discussed in the previous lecture. <clears throat> okay, so now, um, how about an example? <clears throat> So let's talk about um, the, the, the first example of this kind of thing. <clears throat> so my variety X will be the blow up of four points in P2 in general position. So that's the Del Pezzo surface of degree five. There's a unique uh, isomorphism type. <clears throat> so this surface has 10 minus one curves. Those are the 
exceptional divisors, there are four exceptional divisors, and the strict transforms of the lines joining two of the points. <coughs> and they um, have dual graph of the following type. This so-called Peterson graph. Hopefully there are no Satanists in the audience. Um, so uh, <coughs> this graph, so there are, there are 10 vertices corresponding to the curves, and I'm just joining two vertices by an edge um, if the uh, corresponding curves intersect. So we'll now select or choose a cycle of five minus one curves. So that's my, our divisor, D inside X. So that's a, um, that's going to be an anti-canonical divisor. So, so that's then D minus K. This is a log Calabi Yau. Okay, and so let's try to write down a toric model. We've got these boundary minus one curves. And what this graph tells you is that, well, first of all, there is an interior minus one curve um, meeting each boundary divisor, but they intersect in some complicated, complicated way in the interior, which is encoded by this um, star in the middle of the Peterson graph. So I, don't, I won't draw that, otherwise we'll get a headache. But what you can at least see is that two adjacent minus one curves here are disjoint. So adjacent area minus one curves are disjoint. Adjacent meaning, so for instance, these two here that meet um, adjacent boundary divisors. So let's blow those down. I'll get a surface like this. Um, I won't bother drawing the interior curves anymore. So this is now 0, 0, minus 1, minus 1. That's the toric variety for this fat. Bar And uh, one way to say it is it's the blow up of P1 cross P1 in a point. Okay, so that's the toric model. Let's see some adjacent uh, seeds, adjacent toric models. Let's look at a mutation. Okay, so I have this toric model. Let's call it X bar. <coughs> so let's select, uh, say, this center here to blow up. And notice, actually, that we already um, have a P1 vibration here. So this zero curve gives a vibration. This minus one, minus one combination is a, is a singular fiber. So there is already um, uh, uh, a vibration. So take the fiber through Z. Again, we have this picture. We blow up. And we've got these interior minus one curves. 
leave the other center alone, blow down to get to the other toric model, which looks suspiciously like the first, but its sort of orientation has changed. And again, at the level of the fans, what happened, we had this picture. What's the corresponding tropical picture? Um, we're just shearing in the direction of this uh, boundary divisor. So it's the same picture I had before, with an extra ray. So maybe it's good in this picture to mark the rays of the fan uh, corresponding to the a blow up. So here's the. Okay. Um, and what you find is if you keep going, there are exactly five tori in U corresponding to toric models. You find union of five tori. And the exchange graph, in other words, the graph with vertices corresponding to tori and edges corresponding to mutations is just a pentagon. <clears throat> okay, so that's a very nice combinatorial description. Let's go back to algebraic geometry and try to say something new from the point of view of algebraic geometry. So in algebraic geometry, what do you do with a del Pezzo surface? Well, you like to embed it in projective space by its anti-canonical linear system. Let's do that. This embeds in P5. And I'll call the coordinates x1 up to x5 and t. <clears throat> I'm going to choose this embedding, so I'm going to choose coordinates um, in a specific way here. So we choose coordinates can choose coordinates such that, well, first of all, the divisor D, that was a section of minus K, is just given by the hyperplane at infinity, T equals zero. And X itself, or let's talk about U, actually, the affine piece, has the following equations. I'll use ind indices mod 5 for brevity. So there are five equations. This is in A5. And I'm writing little xi for the affine coordinate big xi over t. <coughs> so then the x1 up to x5, these are what are called the cluster variables. Um, oh, sorry, before I, I say that, let me say, what's the connection with, between this, this and these tori? Um, so the tori, ti, is just given by, so it's just a locus where xi and xi plus one are both non-zero. And, you know, so that's a torus with these two variables as coordinates. So that's a little exercise to check. So these are x1 up to x5, what are called the cluster variables. And the clusters are just the pairs corresponding to cluster tori. <coughs> so... One thing I wanted to mention is, okay, what's the uh, basis of the cluster algebra, the, the global sections of global functions on the variety, the cluster algebra? That's just global functions on U. So this has a canonical basis. The 
this case, given by the cluster monomials. Um, so what are they? They're just monomials with positive um, exponents in the cluster variables of, of each seed. So this has a basis as a complex vector space by this, by this set. <coughs> yeah, and so in the notation of Fermin and Zelvinsky, this is called the A2 cluster algebra. You can find it in um, Fermin and Zelvinsky's paper from 2001. Uh, before I start erasing, are there any questions about this example? Okay, so let me give one more example then, uh, which shows that um, things can be more complicated. <coughs> so I wanted to give an example that was related to what's been discussed in um, Corti and Kasprick's lectures. So let's talk about the mirror to P2. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, no, so I is, um, so it goes from one to five, but I'm using Z mod five. I'm just using, when I wrote down the equations, I used indices mod five. Yeah. Um, it is, um, <laughs> um, so, it does, I mean, it is actually related to some of this work, so we actually use that construction in some of our work on cluster algebras. Um, it's somewhat different in that the Hertzberg construction, if you remember, it's an analytic construction. You have to restrict um, to um, an analytic open subset of the torus when you take the quotient. So, you're not actually getting an affine variety at the end, you're getting a Stein manifold, and so, there's, you know, the ring of functions on that manifold is, is not, um, you know, it's not a finitely generated C algebra. But maybe I can discuss with you later. But, um, yeah. Okay. So, the second example, the mirror of P2 together with a smooth elliptic curve. So, I haven't told you about mirror symmetry yet. So, um, you'll just have to, if you want, you can just take this as the definition. So what is it? Well, let's first start with a singular pair. Let's call it X prime, D prime. This is the following cubic surface in P3. So it's given by the equation X, Y, Z equals T cubed inside P3. Or, if you prefer, another way to say it, you can take P2 and quotient by the action of the third roots of unity acting in the following way, so x0, x1, x2, maps to x0, omega x1, omega squared x2. Either way, what does this guy look like? Well, there's a triangle of lines at infinity. This is sort of x, y, z equals zero. That's, that's going to be my divisor d prime. Um, I guess I should say, rather, it's defined by the equation t equals zero, but it's given by these lines. And the nodes of those lines, sort of a little analysis of the equation, homogeneous equation, so now passing to local coordinates, these are going to be what are called A2 singularities. Um, so local equation will be 
the local equation x y is <clears throat> so this is not a um, smooth surface but it's easy to resolve so let's resolve what do you get so this resolution of an a2 singularity that's another little exercise. It's just a chain of two minus two curves. So we have this picture. And uh, these lines are just the strict transforms of the components of D prime. Uh, a short calculation again will show that these have self-intersection minus two as well. So this will be our new divisor D. And we have a pair X D. So this is a log collab, yeah. So again, so here, if you call this map pi, um, D is the full inverse image of D prime. <clears throat> and this is a very nice variety. It's actually an elliptic vibration over P1. It's an elliptic vibration. Uh, with well, the fiber over infinity being this uh, reducible fiber D, this is a, um, a cycle of nine minus two curves, or in Kadira's notation, this is an I9 singular fiber. So the picture is um, got three rational nodal fibers, and then this I9 fiber. <coughs> and let's call this map. Uh, w, that's the uh, Landau-Ginsberg potential in the um, terminology of the talks by Alan Alessio. <coughs> okay, so let's see. So this is a log collab Yao with maximal boundaries, so it has a Toric model. What is it? Well, in fact... I sort of keep the picture as before. Um, these uh, minus two curves, which were the strict transforms of the components of D, have um, an exceptional minus one curve attached to them. Those are disjoint minus one curves. These are... Um, in terms of this uh, rational elliptic vibration, each minus one curve will be a section of that elliptic vibration. <clears throat> and the toric model is just given by blowing these down. Um, well, uh, let's see. So... <laughs> I actually didn't think about this, uh, but, but they're definitely there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Perhaps it's a good exercise for the reader. Um, but yeah, um, maybe it's uh, not hard to see using the equation of, of x prime. I, I won't spoil your fun. Oh, sorry. Oh, I can also I can answer why there are minus one curves. So remember, a minus one curve is a smooth rational curve with self-intersection minus one. Equivalently, by the adjunction formula... It's a sm okay, sorry. Where are they? Yeah, in this model. Um, and, the, and the answer is I didn't prepare before my lecture, but I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is there another question? Is everybody happy? Okay, good. All right, so, so now um, this is, I claim this is a toric variety. And, you know, again, sort of taking a cue from the, the, the other lecture series, the way, a good way to see this is to draw the polytope for P2. This is sort of the polytope for P2 with the polarization given by O3. So that's just the ordinary triangle, but we've scaled it up by a factor of 3. Okay. Oh, sorry. And now if I just draw the fan given by all the integral points, that's the fan of this of this uh, 
a fan of X is, is given by this um, So the corners are the minus one curves, and every other curve has self-intersection minus two. OK. So let's just do one mutation. So what happens if I start mutating? So again, uh, let's mark with an x the points where I blow up. <coughs> So, for instance, if I mutate at this, um, this vertex here, corresponding to blowing up along this minus one curve, this is going to be my z, you can see that there's not a P1 fibration yet, because I don't have the opposite vector in the fan. So what I first need to do, I take my x bar, and I'm going to replace it by a new compactification, let's call it x bar one, I'm just going to blow up so that this, uh, the, I add the opposite vector to my fan. Maybe I'll just sort of draw it dotted here. And to add that vector, that will be a blow up of precisely this point here. So this is just um, an auxiliary change of our compactification so that we can see what goes on with the mutation. So let me draw that in. So now this becomes minus 1, minus 3, minus 3. I'm really going through the chalk today. Um, is there anything longer than about an inch? Um, uh, okay. All right, so um, there we are. So minus one, minus one. And now what's this? Minus two, minus two, minus two. There's some complicated thing like this. Now this is a, this is a vibration a curve of self-intersection number zero. And now I can do the elementary transformation, blow up here, blow down there. Right, so I won't draw it, but so now I'll get sort of x, x bar one prime um, just by well, the same picture, except now this will be a, um, a zero and this will be a minus three. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. This is minus one. Right? Yeah. Okay. So now. I guess maybe I don't need to draw this whole thing. But. Yeah, so the only thing that's changing is I blow up here, so that becomes minus two. Um, uh, what have I got here? Minus one, minus one. Oops. Um, minus three, minus three. And now, uh, what did I do here? So blue. Um. I'm actually bothered now because that shouldn't be a zero curve. That should be negative. So something is wrong. No, I guess this is okay. Okay, and so now the uh, statement is, so what's the exchange graph in this case? That was just one mutation. <clears throat> so, um, so, of course, if you saw the previous example, you might be hoping for some nice finite graph. That doesn't happen in this case. So, in fact, it's an infinite tree 
uh, with every vertex of degree three, um, and uh, one can describe the combinatorics, so it's combinatorics of the associated fans, Um, is given by the is uh, given by the Markov equation. But anyway, so you know the picture is this, this is this um, equation, which you may have seen in connection with derived categories and etc. Um, uh, but anyway, the point is that there are infinitely many tori. You know, at each point, uh, there are three mutations I can do, and you know that never closes up in, in the maximally possible, you know, the maximal possible way. So somehow, you get this infinite tree uh, you, with no no relations at all, and so just countably many tori in your in your atlas. <coughs> So that's kind of another flavor of example that's actually more typical than the, the, than the first example. <clears throat> um, so I should, say, I should say something about that as well. Yes, yeah, so the Landau-Ginsberg potential um, so if you remember, there's some Laurent polynomials in the talk of um, Alessio and, and Al. So where, where are they? So we have these cluster tori, uh, T inside our U. Uh, U, U being you know, the, this X set minus D, that's the guy that has the landau ginsberg potential mapping to C. Just remove the point to infinity. And so this um, W restricted to T is then a regular function on a, um, on a torus, so it's a Laurent polynomial. So this is the polynomial. Uh, described by uh, Corti and Al. Oh, I'm sorry, Al. Let's see now. <laughs> so, you know, depending on which torus you choose, you'll get a different formula, and the two formulas will be related by this mutation. I realize, Greg, this isn't answering your question, maybe. <laughs> so, what were you asking? You were asking for it described in terms of. Close for. Oh yeah, that, that will be true, right? Yeah. So on, on the on the initial torus, it'll be the usual formula. Yeah. So if this. Yeah. On on the initial torus, it looked like this, and then they'll be obtained by mutation from that guy. Okay. Okay, so I've got 10 minutes left. I just wanted to tell you now, you know, suppose you want to go and do your own computations. You know, how do you translate this picture into combinatorics? It's very easy, but um, I was sort of talking with some guys <laughs> just before the lecture. The problem with this, I mean, this is what Atiyah says, you know, you have to pretend to sell your soul but not actually sell your soul, right? So <laughs> you need to work algebraically and combinatorially, but think geometrically. But anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's start, start the process. So what, what's happening here? I've got this XD described as a blow-up of a toric variety. So what's the data? So I'll use the notation that was introduced in the previous lecture. So I've got my torus, T, is U bar. That's a copy of C star to the N. Um, but if I don't choose coordinates, uh, so there are two uh, abelian groups. So N, that's the 
first homology of the torus, or what's the same thing, it's the one parameter subgroups, that's a copy of z to the n, and then there's m, those are the characters, or, or I guess I could say also h upper one, um, and that's you know, n dual, the dual uh, group. <coughs> So that's just the usual toric notation. <coughs> now what do we do? We, we have a bunch of boundary divisors. So a boundary divisor C, I said this before, that's just going to correspond to a primitive vector V in N. So the ray of rho um, generated by V corresponds to the boundary divisor. <coughs> we have the character chi so remember our center Z was C intersect chi equals lambda for some, some lambda. So chi, <coughs> well that's just an element of M, it's a character. And again, we may, as, we, we may as well assume this is primitive. So this is just assuming that Z is irreducible not primitive, this is just a disjoint union of several connected components. <coughs> and we've got our two form, uh, sigma bar on, on x bar. And as I said before, that's just got um, constant coefficients, so that corresponds to an element in wedge two of the characters tensored with C. <coughs> okay, and there was this condition um, that if you take your form sigma bar and you take the residue along C, you get d log chi up to a constant And again, in terms of combinatorics, what does that mean? So I think of my sigma bar as a skew form on N. I, so taking the residue along C just corresponds to inserting V in the first argument. And then this should be equal to the linear function on N given by nu times N. Okay. Okay, and so, so now I need to tell you what, what did this mutation look like. So we, we gave an example before, and the general case is no harder. <coughs> so we drew the tropicalization of mu. So that was a map um, defined on the ambient spaces of the fans. So it's going from NR to NR. So the fan lives in the uh, space of one parameter subgroups, tensored tensored with the real numbers. <coughs> and we had this picture, so what do you do? Um, so I've got these two pieces of data. I've got um, uh, a vector v and a, a functional m related by this formula. <coughs> so m is determined by v up to scale. So again, V gives me the direction of the shear. 
And I guess maybe I should have drawn a higher dimensional example. So somehow maybe let's make this a three dimensional example. This hyperplane, yes, better like this. So here, shear by V. Um, this hyperplane is M perp. And I guess I, I mean, just to fix ideas, doesn't matter. That, choice is irrelevant, let's say this is the, the half space m bigger than zero, and here it's the identity. And so, you know, of course, you can write a formula, the same, that, same formula that Al wrote last lecture, but in the specific case of cluster varieties. So it's actually an integral map defined by u goes to u. Oh, I'm not sure if my u agrees with, uh, well. So this is the formula, but that, that's just um, the algebraic expression of that picture. <coughs> okay, well, um, I think this is a good place to stop, so maybe I'll continue tomorrow.